All right, we are continuing our journey through the big story of the Bible. A couple weeks ago, we had uh, the story where the, the north seceded from the south. We had, uh, with the death of Solomon, um, things all fall apart, and the north starts down uh, a dark path. Last week, we jumped ahead about 150 years. We met uh, probably the most evil king uh, that Israel had seen, uh, King Ahab, and the prophet that God raised up to confront him, um, Elijah. Well, this week, we're going to jump ahead another 100 years or so, uh, and now the end is near. If you, um, if you, on our timeline here, you can sort of see where, where the Civil War, they split between the north and the south, and at this point, the north just disappears. Um, and that's where we're at in our story. These are the last days for the, for the northern tribes. Um, and, and so we are going to hear from a prophet named Hosea, the last prophet to speak to the north before their destruction at the hands of the Assyrians. Again, for me, it's always helpful to have a little historical context. Uh, Israel and Judah, they were sandwiched in between two superpowers. To the north, they had the Assyrians. To the south, they had the Egyptians, who were always vying for power against each other, and right between the two it was where Israel and, and Judah was. Israel knew it was very vulnerable to be there, and so it said, I, we, can't, we can't defend ourselves against either of these superpowers, so we need to align ourselves with one of them. So they become a vassal state of the Assyrians. They pledge their allegiance, they pay taxes and everything to the Assyrians just for protection. But they get tired of that, and after a while they said, you know, maybe we should switch sides. Maybe we should go to the and have the Egyptians be our friends, you know, because and, and, they don't like the Assyrians any more than we do, and why don't, if we go to them, they'll help protect us from the Assyrians, um, uh, and that's what they decide to do, instead of trusting God to protect them, and that doesn't go well at all. Well, in the midst of this, all this stuff going on, God calls Hosea to, to come and speak to the people. It's one last chance, right? Try to call the people back. They've come right up to the edge, and he says, tries to call them to, to come back. But he doesn't just ask Hosea to, to speak to the people. He has Hosea act out this sort of train wreck of a relationship between God and, and Israel. Uh, so he tells Hosea, I want you to go, and I want you to marry uh, a local prostitute. And this is not a pretty story. It's not like, a, it's not a Disney story. It's not, not pretty woman uh, where they live happily ever after. It's all the hurt and pain that ends up with human trafficking. Uh, she doesn't quit working. She abandons her husband, her, their kids. She spurns their love uh, with all these meaningless encounters. Yet Hosea doesn't give up on her. Now the Bible, you, I feel bad for Hosea. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's one thing to give a heart, preach a message, but to have to live it out. But the Bible uses metaphors all the time to try to talk about this relationship we have between us and God. Um, and so it'll use metaphors like a, a king and a subject, or a, a husband and a wife, or a parent and a child. But ultimately, any of these metaphors, you take them too far, they're going to break down a little bit. And we know that not everyone has a, has a great relationship with a, with a spouse or with, with a child. But still, we, we hold up the ideals. It helps us understand what, what it could be like if things were right between us and God uh, in the kind of relationship. But the other, the other part, the difficulty with, with, the, with the, uh, passages like this is that the cultural differences are so different between the world you know, 3,000 years ago and in our world today. Uh, it was a world where women and children were little more than property that were just uh, bought and sold and changed hands, owned by men. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to go to passages like these if you're going to want to look for marriage or parenting advice without ignoring a lot of stuff. Um, anyway, our reading today, uh, Hosea, you know, the, most of the book has this image, the, the metaphor of this unfaithful, uh, relationship um, going on. But then at the end of the book, where we're going to read today, the metaphor shifts between, instead of a husband and wife, it shifts to that of having a rebellious child. Um, now those of us who, are, who have been parents know sometimes it can be a little challenging. Uh, we have to navigate taking someone who's completely dependent on us for absolutely everything and, and somehow transition them into being a completely independent adult who can make good decisions for themselves. 
And getting from one place to the other is not an easy task because it, it comes in little bits and pieces and tensions uh, and pressures back and forth as we give a little bit more, take a little bit more, and try to learn where the, keep moving the boundaries of how that's going to work. But we want our kids, we want our kids to be resilient. We want them to be able to resist negative peer pressure. But when it's us that we, they are resisting, it just doesn't feel as good, right? Uh, being strong-willed is exhausting. Um, but that's what we find in our story here. How is Hosea going to deal with a strong-willed child? We've got a granddaughter who sort of wrote the book on that. Uh, uh, but they, but they, they have, my daughter said, is it, you know, says, this is payback, isn't it, for what we did to you? I go, yeah. But, um, but it's, uh, instead of strong-willed, the, the new, they have a new book there. What's it called now? Oh, it's called Spirited. Their spirited child. So, I like that. Let's look at Hosea, how he describes this relationship, how, how uh, God as parent and, and, and struggling with this relationship that he has. Now again, Hosea is written not as a, not as a story, it's written as a, po- as a poem. So we read poetry differently than we read just a, a narrative story because uh, it repeats a lot. It says something and then it says exactly the same thing again. So it seems like, didn't I just read that? Yeah, but that's how the, instead of rhyming words, Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas. It says it and then says it again slightly different. So, uh, so we read it differently than when we were reading just a straight story. So uh, part of it goes like this. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. I called my son out of Egypt. But the more I called him, the farther he moved from me, offering sacrifices and Im- to the images of Baal, burning incense to idols. I myself taught Israel how to walk, leading him along by the hand, but he doesn't even know or care that it was I who took care of him. I led Israel along with my ropes of kindness and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck. I myself stooped to feed him. But since my people refuse to return to me, they will return to Egypt. They'll be forced to serve Assyria. War will swirl through their cities. Their enemy will crash through their gates. They will destroy them, trapping them in their own evil plans. God, as parent, knows it's not looking good. We call it, um, sometimes we call it tough love, right? Sometimes we let our children experience the consequences of a behavior that they've chosen. We still want to keep them safe, but sometimes they need to know there's consequences for, for what they've done. doesn't mean we don't love them. Oh, we love them completely. And it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, we don't do our kids any favors by helicoptering over them. All right? you know, you're familiar with that? Parents who just hover all the time over their kids and their kids never get to experience anything because the parents are just overly protective. Or the new term I heard the other day, it was a new one for me, snow plowing parents. Right? Parents who come and simply remove any obstacles in our children's way because we don't want them to struggle with anything and so we clear the way for them which doesn't really help them learn how to live life in the real world because there are struggles that all of us are going to have to deal with and we have to learn how to do that. At some point, as parents, we say, I, I, can't, I can't do anymore. I can't, I can't control this. They need to make their own choices, which doesn't mean we, we in any way stop loving them. And you can hear the heartache, as in the story, uh, as Isaiah goes on, we can hear the heartache of a parent who's had to sort of let their child experience that. Let me read on a little bit. It says, For my people are determined to desert me. They call me the Most High, but they don't honor me. How can I give up on you, Israel? How can I let you go? How can I destroy you? destroy you like Adma or demolish you like Zeboim. Now, Adma and Zeboim, we say, what? <laughs> Again, those are words not very familiar to us. But in other parts of Scripture, they're listed along with Sodom and Gomorrah, places that were destroyed because of their sinfulness. But God says, I cannot give up on you. I can't let go, no matter how much. All week I've been, uh, I've been. Uh, there's been a little earworm going on. I've been. Uh, there was, oh, the, for those of you who lived back in the '80s, there was a singer. His name was uh, was Rick Ashley, uh, and he's got this great little song about never letting go. So I want to share the earworm with you. So here it is. Oh, 
No, I won't. Let, let's well, plug it in. I forgot. To, I tested to make sure it was going to work and forgot to plug it back in. Got it? A little bit of Rick Cashley. I just love the course. I'm never going to let you go. It doesn't matter. Um, my grandkids, uh, they've got a big pile of books, and wherever we go, uh, every night, we've got to read books to them. And one of their favorite ones that they, that they bring is a little book called uh, Runaway Bunny. Anyone ever read Runaway Bunny? All right, that's a, it's a great little book. It's just about a, uh, a bunny who says, I'm going to run away, right? He says, I, you know, I, I don't want to live anymore. I'm going to take off and go. And, uh, uh, and so he said, uh, mom says, I don't care. I'm going to love you anyway. Uh, and Bunny says, all right, I'm going to turn into a fish. I'm going to swim away. And Mom says, you're going to turn into a fish? I'm going to turn into a fisherman, right? And it goes through the whole thing. You, I'm going to turn into a bird. I'm going to fly away. She says, well, I'm going to be a tree where your nest is, right? And goes back all through this whole story and finally says, well, I'm going to become a little boy, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, the bunny says, well, I'm going to become your mom and I'm going to hug you tight. And the bunny finally says, Ah, oh, shucks, I might as well just stay a bunny, right? Uh, and mom says, here, have a carrot. And that's the end of the book. You know, it's, uh, but it's that story of, of, uh, of that kind of parental love that says, I don't care how mean you are to me, uh, I'm going to keep, keep loving you. Back to Hosea. It says, my heart is torn within me, my compassion overflows. I will not unleash my fierce anger. I will not destroy Israel, for I am God. I'm not a mere mortal. I am the Holy One living among you, and I will not come to destroy. This is the God who does not give up on us, even if we give up on us. To me, it resonates with this, this powerful story uh, uh, that Jesus tells of a, of a prodigal son or daughter, right? Uh, the son in this story. But uh, to me, it's one of the clearest images of the gospel, of a God who will not let us go. Joan, come on, let's come on down here. Let's, there's this wonderful old, uh, old gospel song uh, about the one who's always there. I, I, I was thinking of this when I hear the prodigal son, this one who's calling us, always ready to welcome, welcome us back. The, the song is called uh, Softly and Tenderly. <laughs> 